Trustee Petzlikoff. P12 audit report. Mr. Tom Wall. Intr introduce your company. As required by state law, we're required to have an annual audit. And with Plant Moran, we have Jeff here who will give a short presentation on the audit conclusion. Thank you and good evening. Good evening. Certainly, I'd be remiss if I didn't congratulate Becker Elementary and the district on that, uh, that award. That is truly a, a terrific, terrific accomplishment. So congratulations. There's three documents related to our audit of the financial statements for the district's year ended June 30th, 2017 that you've received. There's the financial report with supplemental information, which contains the district's audited financial statement. The federal award supplemental information, which is our audit of the federal programs administered by the district. And the report to the Board of Education, which provides information on the audit process and results. Now, as the district's auditors, it's our responsibility to express an opinion on both the amounts and the disclosures in those financial statements based on an audit conducted in accordance with auditing standards generally accept the United States of America and the standards applicable to financial audits um, containing government auditing standards issued by the Comptroller General of the United States. So I'm happy to report here tonight that based on the results of our audit procedures, we've rendered an unmodified or clean opinion on the district's financial statements. This will be the highest level of assurance that we can provide on a set of uh, financial statements. And with that, we'd like to touch upon some of the financial highlights for the year. So this first slide talks about the two separate layers of accounting that school districts are required to report. The first is what's known as the government-wide. This is essentially the district as a whole. It includes all funds, all assets, liabilities. It's essentially similar to private sector accounting. Next level is the fund level. This is the, uh, the various funds of the district that are recorded based on the... Um, they're classified based on the amounts the monies are intended to be used. And this is really the level where the financial monitoring, the financial... Um, performance the district is typically managed is where budgets are set and some and uh, so forth is at that fund level at the fund level statements. A couple things I did want to point on the government wide level though is you'll notice um, the assets and liabilities and there's that separate line for the GASB 68 pension related liability. So government's uh, county requires all entities that participate in multiple multi-employer uh, plans such as the the MIPSERS program if those plans are underfunded, the districts have to report their proportional share of that underfunding on their government-wide statement. The MIPSERS uh, plan is essentially roughly $25 billion underfunded. So what that means for Dearborn Public Schools is they're required to report on this government-wide statement its share, which is roughly $373 million. Now, one thing to keep in mind related to that, however, is again, we're required to report that, but it's at that higher level. It really doesn't impact the decision making or the focus of the Board of Education. The local districts have no control over that uh, that plan. Um, that's all determined in Lansing. So we are, why we are required to report that at that upper level, again, it's really at the fund level, which is where the financial uh, management of the district occurs. It's where the, the board monitors. It's where the budgets are set. It's, that's really that controls the uh, financial decision making is at that fund level. And that's where we focus our presentation, is at the general fund. So the general fund is the primary fund of the, the district. It's where the vast majority of the activity occurs. We have the assets and liabilities here. You can see at June 30th, 2017, there is assets of roughly $61 million and liabilities of approximately $32 million. On the asset side, the, the most significant asset is receivables, that uh, red piece of the pie there, of roughly $32 million. Approximately 30 million of that is due from the state. So the state aid payments received by the district are actually paid in 11 installments. The first installment begins in October. The last two installments are received in July and August. But that effectively means 18% of the district state aid comes after the end of its fiscal year end. It creates just cash management problems and challenges for districts because they have to deal with that state's delayed payment mechanism to local school districts. Similarly, on the liability side, you'll see the largest liability there uh, is payroll related. So that primarily relates to 26 pay teachers. Um, their obligation to that school year is effectively completed when they finish the school year, but because they are paid out over the summertime for July and August, that uh, those summertime payments are accrued as of the end of the fiscal year end. Next, we take a look at general fund revenue. You see for 2017, revenue is approximately $213 million. The, the largest piece of that is from state sources, 
And of the total revenue, it's important to keep in mind that roughly 70% of the general fund revenue is through the state foundation allowance, which is essentially a formula. It's the district's blended pupil count of approximately 20,600 students times its foundation allowance of about 8,491. And that formula creates roughly 70% of the general fund revenue. It's important to keep in mind that that per pupil foundation is determined in Lansing. What the real takeaway here is that local districts are essentially dependent for their level of funding on Lansing. They have very little ability to control uh, the funding uh, side of the equation from your financial, financial management. One other item to quickly point out, you'll notice the inter-district sources increased rather dramatically from about $3 million in 2016 to 17, uh, about $10 million in 2017. That's primarily the enhancement millage that was passed this year in Wayne County. Uh, the district's uh, piece of the enhancement millage last year was roughly $7 million. Next, we take a look at general fund expenditures by function. You'll see for 2017, roughly 60% of the expenditures were on instructional uh, classifications. It's important to keep in mind that that is the strict state definition of instructions. So that only includes direct classroom activity and uh, essentially direct teacher-pupil interaction. Uh, the next slide or next slice would be support, and that would include things such as operations and maintenance for the buildings, transportation, school administration, essentially the cost of getting the kids to the building and operating the buildings. Next, we take a look at general fund expenditures by object. You can see roughly 87% of the district's expenditures relate to salary and fringes. Obviously, this highlights the fact that it's a, a service business. You're in the business of educating students. So as you might expect, the vast majority of the expenditures are uh, salary and salary-related costs. So the difference between your revenue and your expenditures uh, adds or subtracts from uh, your, essentially what's called your fund balance. We have a history here for the last several years of the revenue over or under expenditures. You can see for the last four or five years, the district was at more or less a break-even level. For 2017, we did actually experience uh, revenues over expenditures of about $14 million. And this adds to, again, what's called your fund balance. We talk about fund balance a little bit on this next slide. Fund balance is essentially, it's the assets of the district minus its liabilities. It's almost, uh, you can consider it as like the savings account for the district. It's intended to serve as a measure of the financial resources available in the general fund. And a reasonable level of fund balance is important as that it helps pay bills so the instructional program can be carried out without disruptions from circumstances outside the district's control. So for example, if there's unforeseen repairs, if there's higher than expected utility bills, if it's a harsh weather, changes in enrollment, there's significant uncertainties in school finance and fund balance helps the, the district deal with those uncertainties in more of a thoughtful manner without the need for immediate and drastic cuts or um, reactions essentially. So the question then of course becomes what is a reasonable level of fund balance? So fund balance is typically assessed as a percentage of expenditures. That's how um, it's typically, uh, typically viewed. So if you take the district's fund balance at the end of the year of roughly $28 million, you divide it by your expenditures about $196 million, it gives you about 14.57% as of June 30th, 2007. So you can see the history here where the district's been, it was in 2013 about 4.4 percent, at about 7.35 percent at 2016. For a uh, point of comparison, this orange line represents the state average for districts. So you can see for the last several years, uh, Dearborn has been um, below that state average level. The complete information for 17 isn't available, but I would expect by the time all the results are calculated for this year, the district will be right around state average at 2000, uh, for June 30, 2017. And it's worth noting that the Michigan school business officials uh, recommend a 15% level of fund balance to, um, to deal with those uncertainties. So the district certainly has improved significantly this year, but um, still a little bit below or with the, the, you know, some of the recommended levels and probably right at about state average. So with that, I'd be happy to address any questions anybody uh, might have related to the year ended June 30th, 2017. Okay, any of the geeks have questions? <laughs> the numbers people? <laughs> <laughs>
I just want to say, <laughs> I'm just looking around, everybody. Dr. We, Dr. Mead. We, are, we already got our, our uh, Yeah, well, we, so. uh, we want to yeah. wear a big smile because, I mean, we're always really happy to get an unmodified and a clean bill of health. That's just a tremendous relief saying that the district has managed public funds well. I'm just always relieved and happy to, to hear that. Well, we got a temporary boost yeah. this year, yeah, basically. Yeah, we, we're so. very lucky. We've been up 500 students over the last couple of years, so, yeah. Dr. Mead? Well, I was just wondering, uh, we're not finished with 2017, so the 14.5 percent could go down, correct? Well, this is for this year. The district's year end is June 30th of 2017. Oh, okay. So this is, you know, we so say this 17. is final numbers. This is final right. numbers for the district's okay. fiscal year end. Okay, correct. so what level the, you recommended 15 percent savings account, but what does the state recommend? What, what, is, uh, what is their cutoff? Well, the state doesn't make a formal recommendation. The state actually does have what they call early warning legislation. So the state is trying to identify when districts risk going into deficits. They have some what they call like early warning indicators. So what the state uses as an early warning indicator is essentially a 5% okay. fund balance level. Okay. They calculate it a little bit different, but it's more or less a 5% level. Okay. What happens is if you go below that 5% level, then there's a significant additional monitoring that goes on because the district, or again, the, the state's trying to prevent districts from going into deficit at an early point. So 5% would be sort of their indication that things are, there's signs of financial distress. But that amount of money savings, 14.57%, uh, how many months does that represent in expenditures? So 14, that'd be roughly, I mean, if you look at it from a school year perspective or a calendar year perspective, I'd have to do the math, but it's probably roughly five to six weeks of operations, I would yeah. guess. So, so it's, it's not a whole lot yeah, of money. Yeah, and that's, and that's why... It's, it's the, nice, it's very positive, yes. but it's not a whole lot of money that the district need. In other words, within two months, we could be... Yeah. <laughs> they could be really down. And that's exactly correct. With a, right. a budget the size of the districts, it's an absolute dollars is significant, but for the size of the, the budget, it doesn't provide a lot of leeway to deal with cir okay. circumstances that might arise. Thanks. That's why Joe Guido always advocated for 20%. <laughs> yeah. He's here just, I know he is. Joe, Joe's all, was always oh, looking to, right? oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything we got was like, put it up. into the. <laughs> he backed that up with actual. Uh, that, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Other yeah. questions? I just Mr. want to thank Rock? Jeff and his team. They're yeah. very professional, <laughs> and this process starts in May when they do some preliminary testing and ends in September. So it's a, quite a long process that we go through to make sure they're very thorough. I also want to thank Mrs. Starrett and her team and Chris Misko. They're the people that are the primary workers on the audit and the year-end close, and they do a yeoman's job. And I'd like to thank you and your department because there really is, that's just really something very important to us, all of us. Uh, public integrity is got to be high. So thank you. Thank and you. thank you for extending your evening here. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, yes. it's a little late. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure. There's lots of great things going on in the district. It's good to hear about everything that's happening out here in Dearborn. So, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Oh. Okay. All righty. Action items. Are there any agenda items on this agenda which board members or the superintendent wish to discuss and vote on separately? If there are, we will exclude these from the motion below. Okay, so we have 13 items. Right. We have one that was added, which is a FOIA fee appeal by Mr. Young. Um, and then I'd like to note that number 10 is at the request of Ms. Becky Chadwick, who's here tonight from Henry Ford College. Normally we wouldn't put college, we don't like to mix college and uh, P12 business, but the reason it's put on is because of the upcoming holidays and we need to be advertising. Uh, the presidential search is I just have one question about program. 10. It doesn't change what I'm going to do. Okay. It, it could really even be just directed to uh, Becky after the fact, but before this gets sent out, because okay. I found a couple of 
okay. typo things that I wanted to make sure were corrected, and it so wasn't just ty it typos that were what's just. Your, what's your pleasure? Do you want to ask the question now, or would Shelley? No, just I just want assurance that she isn't going to run out. Oh, and, uh, okay. So <laughs> okay. send this off in the mail. Okay, good. So anybody want anything else pulled? There's nothing that needs a roll call vote on here. No. Can we? Go through one to thirteen, then okay. Motion then. Okay, move that action items numbered one through thirteen be approved as recommended in this agenda. Support. Second. The support. Before. She said motion. So oh, no. okay. Me yeah, okay. Jim and Mike, is there any dissent from this, or is this a unanimous? This is unanimous, it appears. Okay, very good. Thank you. Trustee Petchikoff, will you read the summary? Number one, approval of warrants. Number two, approval of change orders. Number three, approval of contract to National Environment Group. Four through seven, approval of non-instructional and instructional personnel items for P12. Eight, approval of board meeting date change. Nine, approval of financial statement. Ten, approval of the HFC presidential search profile. 11, approval of opposition to Senate Bill 574, 12, approval of donations, and 13, approval of officially acknowledged receiving the appeal of fees associated with a FOIA request made by Mr. Young and deny that appeal. Okay. We're done with that part of the agenda. Please move to the next. Okay. Get on the right page. Discussion items, policy updates. Curriculum development. Good evening, President Lane, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Maleko. Um, as part of my new role on the board, I, uh, on the um, in the cabinet, I was asked to look at the policies related to curriculum, and so. Um, I undertook that with a lot of different groups, um, and so we looked at th actually four curriculum-related policies and then some supporting administrative guidelines. The guidelines um, were necessary because of some of the changes that had occurred um, here with how we review uh, curriculum as well as how we adopt materials and pilot materials and things that were going on with the curriculum committees. So there were a lot of different groups engaged in this work. Um, we had the district curriculum co-chairs were engaged in this work. We engaged the high school, middle school, and elementary administrators in the work, cabinet members, as well as curriculum council. And so, as you know, and these uh, were included in your board packet this week, only one policy, policy 2210, which is curriculum development, needed some very minor changes. Um, this is just being brought up today. It did go to the policy committee last month, and then it will be voted on at next month's meeting. So the changes were really just to um, change the grade level and content expectations to the state mandated curriculum standards, because of course we've transitioned to uh, the common core state standards as well as the next generation science standards. And so the term state mandated curriculum standards would cover that um, and move us away from the grade level um, content expectations. So I'm just here to um, see if you have any questions about this and to give you a brief history. So were there any questions about the policy or any of those materials? I had a question about the second part, the Carnegie u unit that's referenced in there. Does that continue to need to be in that policy? Well, Carnegie units are a pretty standard, I mean, it is a mm -hmm. measure of credits. Right. Um, and what the policy says is that, um, let me find it in here, is that we would look for another way to measure it. And we do use credits, to, but it is still a term that a lot of people use as far as the way that you measure credit hours. And so, you know, I think that it wasn't, it didn't bind us to that other than looking at other ways yeah, to use it. Yeah, we had so. a little bit of a discussion about that because the way it was phrased, I, it, it read to me as if we had to look for another way. So right. um, I understand that there, there might be block scheduling or other things right. that are options, but I didn't know why it had to mention Carnegie units specifically. Well, you know, we get these from Neola, and, right. and so that comes from there. But, uh -huh. but really, it's, it's, some states still use that. Some states don't. So okay. it is a, a historical measure of credit hours. Okay. So. okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. okay. So you, we'll Dr. be voting Cooper. on that next month. Thank Next you. Month. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you. 
Yeah. Boundary line changes, school of choice and boundary line exemption, Dearborn High School edition. Can I, down to the uh, short guy yeah, I just want to mention too, I, kn I know Mr. Gerlock had mentioned new, Mr. Mustin and Mr. Jafer um, really have been doing an outstanding job at all the community forums, so we really appreciate their hard work and yes. dedication uh, really at all the meetings. And yeah. so thank, thank you. you. Outstanding yes. is the understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. Thank exactly. you. Well, thank Mr. you. Hassan. Yeah. No, thank you. Great right. job. And I like the fact that you're encouraging parents to get involved. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think uh, Mr. Jafer and myself, we would be disappointed if we walked into that room and saw two or three parents there. That would defeat the whole purpose. Um, you know, when you walk in and you see a room full of parents, you know that they care and they're passionate. They may not agree with some of the proposals that are on the table, but, but we're there to get input. So we appreciate them being there and, and we appreciate uh, the board giving us the opportunity to go out into the community and share these with them. I everybody. love the fact that you're, uh, I mean, I know it happened at the first meeting, but we're no longer interrupting parents or students who would let them speak, finish out their thought process before we address them. So sure. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And no language barriers. The fact that Mr. Hassan has been able to, you know, <coughs> present mm -hmm. and uh, even when parents are asking questions or students, he's able to translate that in English and vice versa. And I think that that's been very helpful. Absolutely. Um, so. Yeah, it would be pointless if we didn't reach everybody in the community. So. And the one other thing I like, because when I went to the second one and I, I heard, I actually went to Edsel for a superintendent because I couldn't make the Edsel one. And then I went to the Dearborn High one. And after hearing some of the way people were hearing your presentation, who had been present at the Edsel one as well, because we had pa the parents admitted that they're going to each yeah, and every forum, absolutely. you're changing up the information that you're providing as you hear things that are lacking in the presentation and you're being um, more flexible to make sure that you're incorporating so that we're reaching all those questions yeah. that are coming out and we're seeing where there might be places to tweak right. and no, in order to make sure that we're getting the correct information so that people are hearing um, the same kind of information that we're seeing here at the table. Yeah, the core message has not changed and will not change. What is changing is exactly like you said, um, you know, clarifying points. Clarifying points. And making yes. sure that if something that we said wasn't perfectly clear to somebody, that we're doing it in a different way. I, I have to admit, some of the things that we've added in came from the meetings. People suggested, why don't you do this or add this in? Right. So we, we, we did. Now, the core has not changed, and that cannot change because then we'd be presenting different things at different right. meetings but making sure that clarifying clear. yes and that's a very good way to put it all right great well thanks i'm done okay. <laughs> okay so i do have a little bit of a presentation here and we'll try to move through this um i do want to say that old saying about people stealing my thunder kind of happened but that's okay because we've got some <laughs> other points we can share as well so the presentation we'd like that uh, we're presenting here this evening we're calling it trending topics so as you know when when something on Twitter or in social media is kind of catching some buzz and, and getting some momentum, it, it, they say it's trending. So, so I, I kind of think we're playing off that a little bit and saying here's some trending topics. So uh, just again, a reminder of the timeline, this really started way back in the spring of 2017 and we've been moving through the, the, the summer with this, the study session in August. And right now we're in that October through December part, that community stakeholder meeting. And that's where we're at and that's what we're out doing uh, right now and tonight we're here just to give you a little bit of an update of where we are with those meetings so here's the big schedule uh, we've gone through five of these uh, we've got five more to go looking forward to them we've uh, we'll hear we'll we'll visit Woodworth and Salina Smith Eunice and Bryant and you know I think it's interesting uh, because um, Woodworth Salina Eunice um, that we haven't really been on that side of the city yet, so it'll be interesting to hear the commentary that comes from that side so that we get a balanced amount of feedback from everybody, um, you know, and, and input on, on what everybody is thinking. So there we are. Um, again, uh, do want to stress, we did create a special blog. It's called the Boundary Blog. Very clever name. Took us hours and hours uh, <laughs> to come up with that. 
And uh, if you visit the, uh, if you visit our, the easiest way to get to it is to visit Dearborn Public Schools or DearbornSchools.org. And right on our main page, you can click on that link and get to our Boundary blog. And it has all the information on there, the presentations in English and Arabic. Um, it has the maps. It has a feedback form I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And it has this schedule. So you can attend any of these meetings. If your kids attend um, a school uh, at Bryant, but you can't make it on Thursday and you want to get over to the Woodworth meeting, come on by. We welcome everybody. You get kids in elementary school, you want to come on over to Eunice, and your kids go to Lindbergh, hey, come on over to Eunice. We'll be happy to have you over there and, and share all the information with you. So what are some of those trending topics that we're hearing uh, in the five meetings that we've had so far? Well, one thing that we've had to remind people about is the Heights Campus and the Berry Center. You know, the Berry Center is one of several programs at the Heights Campus. We have the Montessori program, we have the STEM program, adult and community ed, special ed. Um, and we have the DCMST and the Michael Berry Career Center. The Michael Berry Career Center actually ho um, is home to several different half-day programs and the DCMST is also, it's our Dearborn Center for Math, Science, and Technology. It's been in the district for many years. Um, and that is also a half-day program. These programs have a real impact on the number of kids in our high schools. And you have to take that into consideration when you're looking at any of the proposals and looking at the numbers in these proposals. Because there are 700 students, 350 in the morning, 350 in the afternoon, roughly, roughly, um, at these programs. So what do I mean? How do these impact the, the high schools? Well, if you kind of take a look here at our enrollment numbers at each high school, and then take a look at that uh, second to last column, the impact of the Berry Center. So that 262, for example, at Dearborn High, that's the actual impact that the Berry Center and DCMST, and I'm not even including um, dual enrollment, co-op uh, and, and the Collegiate Academy programs because all of these programs take students out of the high school. So that means that creates space in the high school uh, for, our, for, the, for the students that remain there. Is the Berry Center, is that a solution by itself? No, absolutely not. Because you can see that even with the Berry Center, some of these numbers are still over capacity. So it's not a solution by itself, but it is one way that the principals are using in order to manage the students and manage in instruction at the high schools. So another topic that's uh, been coming up, and we heard it mentioned uh, just here at this board meeting, just earlier today, uh, about a fourth high school. Again, no pros and cons here, just some points to consider. Um, we looked at uh, the size needed uh, for acreage, for site, and if you see, for a student of about two, of a, or a high school of about 2,000 students, you're looking at anywhere from 25 to 40 acres of, of land. And this is for the school itself, it's also for the athletic facilities, for the parking lot, all of those kinds of things that go into creating a uh, high school that we would want in our district. Costs for something like that, 70 to 100 million dollars. We don't have 70 to 100 million dollars laying around um, in our back pocket, so that would be something that we would have to go to the voters and ask the voters for approval for that kind of money in a bond proposal. So where did we come up with that number, 70 to 100 million dollars? Where did that come from? Well, we asked business services to kind of, you know, put the pencil to paper, make some phone calls, do a little research. And what, uh, first of all, just taking a look at high schools in Dearborn, average size of the high school in Dearborn, about 280,000 square feet. So if you're going to build a new high school, obviously you'd want it to be comparable to um, anything that we have already existing. Most recent data that we had available for construction costs, 2014 construction cost, 235 to $349 for per square foot. We know that, you know, it's probably a little bit more now because those costs have increased over the years. So if you just were to take a modest figure between there and say $300 uh, per square foot for construction, multiply that by 280,000, you're gonna come up with some or a number right around the $80 million mark, maybe just a little bit over that. So you can see that that 70 to 100 million is a realistic number um, based upon these figures that we came up with. 
And then, of course, add, um, adding in about another $10 million for furnishings, technology, supplies, and other miscellaneous costs. Some other points to consider. Um, if, if you did build a fourth high school, it, it most likely would impact all three high schools or all four high school boundary areas. Uh, you could build one high, if you built a high school, I don't think it would be realistic to assume that two would stay the same and only one would change or two would change and one would remain. I think it's realistic to, th to say that if a fourth high school would, would, was built, it would impact in some way the other three high schools that are existing. Um, looking at enrollment projections, this is just looking at what the numbers might be um, and dividing it out by four, you'd see that the high school, uh, you're looking at about 1,700 students per school. Uh, most likely uh, the opening for a, for a new high school. If the board were to say, let's say everyone said, boy, yeah, we want a new high school, that's the way we're gonna go, that's, we're gonna put it back on the table and discuss that and go with that. And let's say you came to that decision in March or April. So by the time you put together plans, submitted them to the state for approval, and then, it, because if you're bonding for this, the state has to approve those plans, had architects draw up those plans, um, then secured the land, purchased the land, went out for a bond proposal, put that on the ballot, voted for that, and then started construction. Um, a, a rough timeline of that would be probably opening in about the fall of 2023. And then also you have to look at the average operational cost uh, for high schools, anywhere from two to three million dollars. That's based on our existing high schools now. So if you added a new one, you would have to say that you were adding about two to three million dollars to the annual budget. And again, I'm not saying, I'm not making a case for or against. I'm bringing out the facts that we would have to consider, that the board would need to consider um, in this discussion of a fourth high school. And there may be other facts that, that we, that you may have questions about that you may you know, need more information about as well. So that, that's great, you can add that in as, into, the, into the conversation. So another trending topic, and again, we heard about it here tonight, um, the creation of a ninth grade academy. Again, some of the points to consider, just the availability of, of buildings or space within the city. Um, you know, any possible, uh, any site that, you, that you've got, uh, that you were to move into, um, I, I would highly be unlikely, once again, that that site would be just move-in ready, that there would have to be some renovations to bring it up to the standards that we're used to in our district. Um, and then sometimes when you do that and you move in to go into a place and start moving things or doing renovations, there's always those kinds of those things that uh, you don't expect. Um, asbestos abatement is probably one of the most common things that pops up when you're going into any building to kind of take a look at renovating it or moving things around. Also, sometimes buildings are fine as they sit, but if you go in and start renovating them, then that forces you now to bring them up to the most current uh, requirements and standards, such as fire suppression, ADA compliance, and then other health and safety issues that might pop up. And then, of course, technology. You know, all of our buildings are wired uh, with Wi-Fi, so that would be something that we would have to bring into every, any building. All of our buildings are connected through fiber optic as well. So any kind of, um, you know, building that you brought into the inventory, you'd have to put that, that would have to be part of the equation when figuring it out. And again, these are just points to consider. It's, it, they're not saying you can't do it. They're not saying you can do it. They're points that the board needs to consider as they're moving forward and making those, those tough decisions. Another trending topic uh, we've been asked about is the cost to some of the additions, if, if additions were put on to uh, the existing high schools. So we take a look at Dearborn High and you see that uh, that four classroom addition and a cafeteria addition there, around three million. Um, I'm gonna jump down to the Berry Career Center because that one is uh, a six classroom addition and cafeteria about 5.5. But the most, but the bigger one there, the one that needs a little bit more, you know, looking at there is the Etzel Ford uh, construction. If some things were done at that school, you're looking at eight classrooms and a cafeteria at about 3.3 million. Or another consideration, another topic that was brought up was constructing a new field house and auditorium uh, over at Etzel Ford and then taking the existing gymnasium and pool 
and renovating that into classroom space. So if you kind of break that down a little bit into different aspects um, and different projects, you can see what the costs are uh, for that uh, renovation over at Etzel Ford. So those are all you know, some, some, some things that uh, have popped up and we wanted to share with you. Um, obviously, uh, because of uh, the schools that we were at, um, that, you know, the, the discussion really impacted the Etzel Ford community and O.L. Smith community. So obviously, um, those communities favored proposal too, uh, because that kept O.L. Smith at Etzel Ford. And that's what, those, that's what those communities have shared, and that's, that's what they like. They feel that it creates a bigger sense of community at the school, that that's really their anchor uh, middle school for that school, and, and they really would like to keep O.L. Smith right there going to Etzel Ford. And then um, there was a, um, a suggestion about moving Salina students uh, to Fortson and then have all of Stout attend Etzel Ford. So, you know, that's, that's possibly something that may come up as we move to Salina to give this presentation. Um, there may be some feedback from the Salina community about that. How do they feel about changing from Etzel Ford back to Fortson? It's been many years. Uh, 1988 is when that change was made. So those students have been going to Etzel Ford for a long time. There may be a sense of tradition, a sense of pride that the students from the Salina area like, and they want to continue going to Etzel Ford. We'll find that out when we go to the meeting and we get some feedback from that, that community. So talking about the feedback a little bit, you know, um, one kind of, we've heard this pop up a couple times and people said, well, I'm voting. I'm voting for this proposal or I'm voting for that proposal. Well, okay, that, that's fine. You can, on the, on the survey, on the online survey, you can select which proposal you like the best, but it's not a vote. It's not like I vote for this, so that's the one, if that gets the most votes, then this is the one that's gonna pass. Or if I, this one votes the most, then this one's gonna pass. It's not a vote, it's feedback. It's information, it's data that helps, goes in, uh, that will help the board in making their final decision. Um, it's not just voting for, I like this one. It's also the comments, it's also the commentary. At every meeting, we've been taking notes and having those notes transcribed and sharing those back with the board. This survey, this online survey that's on the blog site has over 400 responses already. We're gonna compile all of that. I don't know if you guys really wanna hear the ones that say, you know, hey, go stick your head in the sand. I, I can't stand you guys, you know, but we'll put them in there. We'll put all of those together into one category and we'll put, try to, you know, put this data together in a readable format for you so that you can use that as really good practical information to help you in your decision. Uh, as well as all the other factors that are going to go into it. So, um, so, so I, I encourage everyone to visit the, the Boundary blog. Fill out that survey. Give us your feedback. Take the time. There's time on that survey allows you to actually type in your responses as well and, and provide that very important information. Or if you just want to send us an email, send us an email. We've got a communications uh, at Dearborn Schools email site. Drop us a line. We'll be more than happy to respond to that or add that to the commentary. You don't have to ask a question, you can just share your comments, that's fine as well. So what are some of the next steps? Again, all of that will be, uh, all of that information will be kind of digested and put together into a good form and then shared back with, with the board. And then I'm sure as all of you move forward in your discussions over the next months here, um, you know, you will, you know, bring that as part of, of in, as part of your regularly scheduled meetings, like you've been doing since back in May, when this topic has been part of your regularly scheduled board meetings. And if a special study session, like you did in August, that may be required as well, but we'll see as, as we move forward. And then just once again, I just wanna remind everybody, we're on the road. Mr. Jafer and I are on the road again and uh, at Woodworth on Friday, actually Mr. Jafer is, is out this week, so um, I'll be doing a solo act on, on Friday. Uh, mm -hmm. But we've had lots of great support. Cabinet members have been present, principals have been present, board members have been present, and we appreciate you being there and, and helping us, uh, um, you know, in, in, in sharing this information with our community. And uh, with that, I'm done. Okay, who has a comment? I, I just have a question um, because I had asked 
could we start to read some of the stuff that was being um, sent through mm -hmm. the blog? And when I opened it up, um, there was like multiple, it was clear from one individual that was a repeat of the same sure. commentary all the way across. And there was like 15, 20 of, of the same individuals. Um, so they must right. have, did, is that a glitch in the system or did they just keep on submitting it over and over just again? Just keep, kept on submitting. So, so yeah. let them know that this isn't a vote online. So <laughs> that, because I just kept on looking at it. It took up a lot of space and time that, right. you know, um, it, it, it didn't serve a purpose, quite frankly. The one time is enough. You yeah. don't need to keep on. And that's the kind of thing that we we will, you know, once these meetings are done in November, in December, that's what we'll do. We'll go through clean that, that and up. clean okay. that up for you guys. Right. And we may say, this comment was shared 22 times by this right. person. Or, you know, we don't know because it doesn't yeah. track emails. Yeah. But we can say the same individual responded Sent 22 this. times. Right. So. Well, I thought that the uh, <coughs> forums that I attended were respectful. I was really Absolutely. impressed with a lot of the comments. Um, I'd like to defend my fellow board members. I did respond to one uh, email and just say, we spend hundreds of hours being on this board reading. So I know that a lot of people can't attend all of those. Some people care for elder parents. Some people have young children. Some of us were Some splitting. We were going we were at Henry places. Ford College so, at the yeah. time that the Fords yeah. won. So have we have we wear a lot of that. have a lot yeah. of duties. And next, uh, Salina is next Monday. Yeah. We've got the yeah. college board meeting. Right. That. Yeah. So we so can't attend all of these. So people do watch those, and uh, you know, I I. I I think that the board really does work at it a lot. Um, but at, at some of the meetings, I was particularly impressed, um, and a couple of comments made me think about future direction. I want the less disruption. Almost everybody's pretty happy right. with where they are. The less disruption possible, uh, that's better for everybody. We do have to make some changes, um, but Whoever moves should be celebrated. Those are our students that are going to be well received at the receiving school they go to. And they should be celebrated. They should definitely not be bullied. There was a parent at uh, Fordson who had been among the first group that moved from Salina. And I, I don't want anybody to have to experience a bad experience. So the new school coming in, should have all high fives or the new students coming in. Um, and there was another parent at uh, the Edsel meeting who was, uh, I mean, everybody knows certain families at Edsel that have probably put a couple hundred people through uh, Edsel Ford. And uh, she said, I just can't imagine the XYZ family not being an Edsel family. I, I just laughed when I heard it because it, it really is true. People uh, feel passionately. They expressed really good ideas. Uh, so that I know for, for me, I haven't made up my mind. I, I like proposal two. I'm inclining that way. I'd like to see some things uh, cleaned up with that. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll sure. uh, you know, everybody, I've heard quite a bit, oh, the board has already decided. I will say for myself, I've changed my mind on several different things, and I'll probably still change my mind on other things. So uh, that is not the case. Um, so, Trustee Thorpe. In the presentation that's been given at the community forums, you look at the forecasted population growth, but I want to say you're only looking out a couple of years, one, two, maybe three years. Were you really looking out all five? Because well, it, it seemed to me that we've seen yeah. more numbers, more projections than's being shared with the community. So when we're getting all the uh, thoughts of a fourth high school, the numbers that we've seen look like we might peak in two or three years. Now, if that's the case, it makes it tough to consider doing something like that. Maybe those numbers aren't true. Maybe we do continue to grow. But at this point, it's hard for us to try to justify the cost for a fourth high school when at least right now these projections don't seem to tell us that it's And necessary. the timing of it, the amount of time it would take by the time the fourth high school was in operation, the peak would be yeah. come and gone. Not that we shouldn't 
Not that we don't. We, we want to have options right. because we don't want to just fix the, the current situation and run into another problem a couple of years from now. Right. Uh, we've all said, Absolutely. and I've said this to yeah, parents at those up. meetings, we don't want to have to address this right. again in a couple of years. We're hoping it's 20 years until we have to do it. I, I also have to agree that I've went back and forth on, on these proposals. And I want to specifically talk about the community meetings and how every board member here was pushing for the community meetings and to get input from the parents. And I know just yesterday I was speaking, I actually spoke to a couple of board members about splitting sometime. For example, I'll be there this Friday. I know I couldn't make it the last time. I specifically spoke to the board members that were there asking, well, what happened? Try to watch That's the exactly videos, reading, you know. So I want for everyone out there to know that that's really what is, when I say I've went back and forth, it's because of those comments. It's because uh, of keeping up. For example, we can't be there for at the Salina meeting. And to be honest with you, that's bothering me. I know that there was a proposal put forth by some Edsel Ford parents saying that all Salina students should be removed from Edsel and taken to Fortson. And we want, it's very important to hear from the Salina community about this. I think that every school is going to have uh, their own input, their own interest, and I think it's important throughout our communications is to keep every single school in mind and look at this as what's in the best interest of the community as a whole while staying focused, staying student-centered, and also fiscally responsible because we owe that to, to the entire community. We truly do. So, Director Maliko. Just uh, wanted to mention too that I found the community forums very valuable and they've helped turn, change my viewpoints too. Mm -hmm. And I think that once the team comes together and we start looking at maybe some, you know, some alternatives from within the proposals, we've maintained the proposals for the integrity because that's what we started. What we we started want to make with. sure that we get to every school and they, they see the same thing with some of the tweaks. Uh, I would also say that you know when we created the schedule, we didn't, we couldn't wait for everybody's schedule, even mine. Uh, for example, I was in Washington, so I couldn't make one of them because I was at the Blue Ribbon. So we ha had to move forward with Mr. Uh, Mustin and Mr. Jafer's schedule because that was the only way to get it done in a more expedient manner. Having said that, I've tried to as well juggle, and I think I had a pre-scheduled uh, community forum with Representative uh, Abdu uh, Hamoud and uh, Commissioner Waranchuk at Salina. That did come up at Salina. We told them they were... You know, we're coming at Salina. I'm actually, Miss Ali Bazzi's going to go for me to the college meeting, and I'm going to go to Salina. That way I can get a firsthand, you know, account from that group. Because when we went last time, as far as they know, the there is no proposals to move Salina. So I would definitely want to share some of that with them so we can get an accurate viewpoint. Because one of the other issues is with the busing, um, not to say that it couldn't, but busing over to Fortson, uh, would, I've talked to the Tr director of transportation it would be much more difficult over there because of the infrastructure and what mr andrews has said is that if you did want to move um, and again it can be it's not that it can't be done it's just that he would have some concerns with the infrastructure around fortson with the number of people coming and going where buses would come in and out so that'd be something he'd have to look at so just as another factor mm -hmm. to mention yeah. i know there are some parents who are recording videotaping the, the forums is it possible to videotape something now because none of us can make it we could look in. We could look into that. It might not be anything as elaborate as this, but yeah, we could maybe yeah. just do one camera, just something, and something along those lines. Send us a link. We can follow sure. it or something. Sure. Sure. Well, Eric, this. Jacob, you just got a job for Friday. <laughs> Cancel your Friday plans. Oops, Jacob, sorry, low man on the totem pole. He's gone. <laughs> no, Mr. Barry, we'd be. You can join we'd be, me. We'll, we'll we'd be go pleased together. to do that. That'd Thank be you. very yeah, helpful. Yeah, that would be. We'd be pleased to do that. Thank you. Uh, we don't have anything scheduled at River Oaks because it's an elementary school, but I'm, uh, I'd like to hear feedback maybe at a PTA meeting from River Oaks. Uh, one of the proposals uh, keeps the middle schools together and drives the River Oaks students past Dearborn High to Edsel, which uh, I don't know that that's preferable. Uh, it does keep the Smith kids together. Uh, but the Smith kids right now are splitting off and the River Oaks kids go to Dearborn High. Maybe the River Oaks community likes that. I mean, it's less busing. So there's, there's a couple of other areas that are kind of could be cleaned up maybe and maybe they're logical splits. I, I know in the beginning I thought keeping the middle schools together was a good thing. 
Uh, I went through the, as did a couple of people, through the prior boundary, yeah. and, which was very difficult like this. Uh, I mean, everybody gets really... It's emotional. A, it's very emotional because you're talking about your children's education and, and all of our children's education. So everybody deserves the best education. That means for a ninth grade academy or I don't want to build... Uh, I don't want a, a, a fourth high school that's inferior to all the others or, or not as good. So all of those things are, are important to weigh. Um, and it, it's, been difficult, it's been a difficult process. But there are some areas maybe that, that could be cleaned up um, and maybe, I don't know, smaller populations. But we need to pay attention to all of those things. So I expect that the final proposal will be different than all, th all four of what we started with. And, and, I, and I think that'll be an improvement. And I'd so. like to say, because we keep hearing from some of the parents about why do we keep one and three on there. Well, number one, I heard from, I had somebody at Fordson who was, she, she was supporting number three. Um, we, had to, we had to make sure that everybody knew that we had more than one proposal, that we looked at different options, and that these were the, the potential solutions so that you could compare and contrast. If we only came up with the one and said, this is it, this is what we're offering you, then people from other parts of town are going to say, well, what about us? Where, where did you think about this? Well, we're showing that we are, we were considering the different options, what they would look like. If you don't like one and three, that's fine, but somebody else might think that that works for them and their, and their neighborhood. And you have to let them know that we thought of it and we considered it and it is a blend potentially down the road of something completely different. But to just, just take them off now because one community is strongly in favor of one of the options isn't fair to the rest of the um, school communities out there who are going to be hearing this as well, and they are also potentially impacted. Just to follow up on President Lane's comments regarding the River Oaks uh, area, River Oaks Elementary, uh, I think it might be a great idea to do a mini presentation at their PTA meeting because I can tell you all the parents I talk to have no clue what I was talking about when I mentioned, hey, how come you're not getting involved? They have no clue. And they're going to be probably most impacted no matter what we do. We can contact the principal and set something sure. up over yeah. there. That's no problem. Yeah. I'd just like to add, my partner, uh, he, uh, touring like partner, <laughs> Mr. Jaffer, is <laughs> here this evening. I, yes. I feel empty without having him here. Inside. Um, but, you know, Mr. Jaffer's been in this district a long time, and I just couldn't be more pleased and just honored to work with such a gentleman that he is. His experience as a principal <laughs> is just so valuable when we go to these meetings and his ability to relate to some of the questions that have come that have come up in these meetings, so um, I just, I like I said, I just want to thank Mr. Jaffer for all of his guidance and help, and and him and I are, um, it's a it's a pleasure to work with him. I almost didn't recognize you without him standing beside you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, there have been some other uh, ideas also that aren't really boundary related, but they could impact uh, movements of students. Uh, one was suggested by Mr. Casebolt. Uh, one thing that he mentioned is that a lot of our teachers don't have the time to go explore our neighborhoods. So as a professional development day, when we do have new students coming in, it might be a good idea for them to visit their new, neighborhood. the new neighborhoods to welcome the new students. Uh, another idea would be a dedicated shuttle from Edsel Ford maybe to the college or having college professors come over to Edsel to instead of moving people to induce people so there, there's lots of different ways to look at it and uh, i think people have been really creative uh, mr gerlach and his wife are a couple uh, but uh, it's a difficult topic and and i think that by and large we've handled it well and i'm very hopeful that people will continue to think and and bring forward the best possibilities i know we all want that so Hope for that. Anybody else? 